So um, in lecture here, we're going to talk about chapter 16. Chapter 16 goes over the autonomic nervous system. So um, in chapter 15, we talk about the somatic nervous system. Somatic nervous system has both sensory and motor um, fibers, okay? both sensory neurons and motor neurons. Okay? The autonomic nervous system has only motor neurons. Okay, so in other words, the somatic nervous system is both afferent and efferent. Okay? Whereas the autonomic nervous system is only efferent. There's only motor neurons involved. So if we look at this diagram here, um, we can see that once um, the brain is going to send out a command, it's going to send out a command either through the somatic nervous system, and so it, it, it sends commands out through motor pathways, and if it's going to go to a skeletal muscle, then it's going through the somatic nervous system. If the brain wants to send a command out to anything else, it's going to go through the motor pathways and then through the autonomic nervous system. And then the effectors are going to be everything other than skeletal muscles. So it would be smooth muscles. Smooth muscles are found in blood vessels, in intestines. Okay? Um, it will go to the cardiac muscle, which is the heart. Um, the effectors will also be the glands, like salivary glands, mucus glands. Okay? Um, and then we have um, adipocytes. So we are going to concentrate today on the autonomic nervous system. So the only thing the autonomic nervous system has are motor neurons going out to those structures. Okay? So let's see the difference here between the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So here's the somatic nervous system. And we can see that the motor neurons they all start in that one gyrus, right? So they're starting in the post-central gyrus, which is called the primary motor cortex. And that sends down that, to that axon our action potentials, and those first neurons that we see coming from the post-central gyrus, that's called an upper motor neuron. Then the upper motor neuron synapses onto another neuron. That neuron is called a lower motor neuron. And that lower motor neuron goes out to a skeletal muscle. Right? So that's the somatic nervous system. That is the motor portion of the somatic nervous system. But chapter 16 is talking about the autonomic nervous system. So here's what we get with the autonomic nervous system. First of all, the command isn't going out to a skeletal muscle, so the upper motor neuron is going to start in different areas in the cortex. So here we can see, right here, we can see right there that we have motor neurons, um, and they are starting that command. So we have the upper motor neuron, and then that's going to synapse onto another neuron. Now in the, in the autonomic nervous system, we don't have just one lower motor neuron. There's two motor neurons. We see this motor neuron, and then that synapses onto a second motor neuron, and then that goes out to the effector. We always have that with the autonomic nervous system. There will be two peripheral ner neurons. And so we call these, this first one is the preganglionic neuron, and the second one is the postganglionic neuron. Okay, let me show you just a little picture, a bigger picture here, so we can see that again. This is the autonomic nervous system. We have the preganglionic neuron, and that synapses onto the postganglionic neuron. Now, whenever we have a synapse, that's when the two neurons come together or where the neuron comes um, to the effector, we always have the same thing. The neurotransmitter is released. The neurotransmitter binds to the receptor on the opposite cell, 
opens up the sodium gates and sodium comes in. Okay? So far we've only been talking about ACH as being the neurotransmitter. Right? We're going to see a couple other neurotransmitters when we go through the different divisions of the autonomic nervous system. But those are the big differences between somatic, somatic's going to skeletal muscle, there's only one lower motor neuron. In the autonomic nervous system, we're going to everything else, smooth muscle, glands, cardiac muscle, and adipocytes. And we have a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron instead of a lower motor neuron, one lower motor neuron. Okay? Now, where the preganglionic and the postganglionic neuron meet, um, we have that cell body of the postganglionic neuron. And a nerve, this is coming out in a nerve. So a nerve is made up of many, many neurons. So we're going to have many, many cell bodies right in this area. And whenever we have a cluster of cell bodies, we call it a ganglion. So that's how we came up with preganglionic neuron and postganglionic neuron. Before the ganglion, after the ganglion. All right, so let's take a look at the two different divisions of the autonomic nervous system. The first division that we have is the sympathetic division. Okay, so we have sympathetic and parasympathetic division. Um, they do the opposite things. They create the opposite responses in the body. They're going out to all your glands, your smooth muscles, your cardiac muscle, your adipose cells, but they are different. The sympathetic nervous system, that's your fight or flight nervous system. So that one's going to react whenever you are angry or upset or scared. And it's going to have everything in your body happen that you would normally think would happen when you're ready to flee or when you're angry. Okay. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system, that's your rest and digest nervous system. So that's the one where you look at all your organs and you think, well, what would my organs be doing if I'm resting and digesting? They, most of the organs in your body are going to be um, controlled by both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. But they're never going to be working at the same time. That would be foolish. You're going to have the sympathetic nervous system working, activated, when you're in your fight or flight mode, you're going to have your parasympathetic nervous system working when you're in your rest and digest mode. And then there's a couple of different um, effectors that are only innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. But most of them are innervated by both. And we would call that dual innervation when an organ um, the smooth, when a smooth muscle or a gland or a cardiac muscle is innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic. So this picture here is the sympathetic nervous system, and that's where we're going to start. Um, so you have to know the difference between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. This is sympathetic. So the sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight nervous system. So the first thing we notice is that the neurons are coming out of spinal nerves, and only spinal nerves. We don't see them coming out of any of the cranial nerves, right? The other thing is they're not coming out of every single spinal nerve. They're only exiting in the T1 spinal root, uh, spinal nerve, to the L2 spinal nerve. So the sympathetic nervous system exits the central nervous system between T1 and L2. It's coming out of those spinal nerves between T1 and L2. So that's number one. Okay, that's one um, important thing about the sympathetic nervous system. The second important thing about the sympathetic nervous system is we're going to look at the length of the preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron. The length. So the preganglionic neurons are in red. The preganglionic neuron <coughs> is pretty short. It comes out here, it synapses right away onto the postganglionic, so it has a short preganglionic neuron. Even here, where they're a little bit longer, they're still pretty short. Okay? 
So that neuron is only going to be, um, it's going to be pretty short. It's going to, it's going to be stopped right outside of the spinal cord. So it's not very long at all. And then it synapses onto the postganglionic neuron. And the postganglionic neuron is very long. So in the sympathetic nervous system, we have a short preganglionic neuron and a long postganglionic neuron. Okay? All right, um, so now, T1 to L2, short preganglionic, long postganglionic. Now let's look at the organs that it goes to. Well, let's, not the organs, but the glands and the smooth muscle and the cardiac <laughs> muscle um, and the adipose cells. You can see all of those organs, all of those viscera here. All right, so we're looking at all these things. So first we'll look at the eye. Okay, now um, it's going to the smooth muscle of the iris, right? The smooth muscle of the iris. And it's actually going to um, the dilator muscles. Because what happens when you're in fight or flight mode? What happens to the pupils of your eye? They get really big, right? Like you see a bear, oh, they get really big. So we get pupil dilation. What about with your salivary glands? Think about if you have to stand up in front of a crowd of 200 people and give a speech. What would happen to your salivary glands? They dry up. Everything dry, it dries up, right? Your heart, what about your heart? It would start beating like crazy, right? It would beat very fast. So you, you um, stimulate heart contraction. What about the lungs? So with the lungs, we're looking at a couple of things. In the lungs, we're looking at the bronchioles, the airways. There's smooth muscle in the airways. If you are in your fight or flight mode, are you going to have those airways dilate or constrict? Dilate. You're going to want more air going into your lungs because your lungs are going to breathe faster. They want you to breathe faster, get more oxygen in. You're in fight or flight mode. Also, to the diaphragm muscle. What's it going to make the diaphragm muscle do? Contract faster, so you breathe faster. All right, so um, that's the lungs. The whole digestive system. Here we have the whole digestive system. Do you think that your digestive system has to work when you're in fight or flight mode? Absolutely not. Yeah. Your digestive system is going to be inhibited, meaning all the glands in the intestinal and stomach area are going to stop. They're going to be inhibited. You're not going to be secreting mucus or um, any of the digestive enzymes um, to digest food. No, we want to divert all our energy to the heart and the lungs, right? We want those things to be working. We want all glands to slow down, to shut down. No, no tears, right? No, um, no um, sal saliva, no mucus, no digestive enzymes. We're gonna dry everything up when the sympathetic nervous system is activated. Um, with the urinary system, that's going to inhibit that. You don't need to be making urine when you're in fight or flight mode, right? Okay. With the um, with the reproductive system, arousal will be inhibited, um, but the sympathetic nervous system is needed for um, orgasm or ejaculation. And then we have some other um, organs over here. So these, all of these over here, um, I just. We just talked about how the sympathetic nervous system makes them respond. However, um, these organs, they are also going to be innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system, those same organs over there. Then we have these organs over here, and those organs are only sympathetic, so not parasympathetic. And so we're looking at the sweat glands. Sweat glands are only sympathetic. They are only controlled by sympathetic nervous system. Okay? So when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, when you're scared, nervous, you're going to sweat, right? Those glands get activated and you start to sweat. Okay? Um, the erector pili muscle that attaches to the hair follicle, that gets stimulated. What happens when you're scared? Your hair stands on end. And then we have these 
peripheral blood vessels. Those are blood vessels under your skin, right? Right under the skin. Those are called peripheral blood vessels. And so what do you think when you're in your fight or flight mode, do you think those blood vessels, the smooth muscle of those blood vessels, do you think they're going to contract and make the blood vessels constrict? Or do you think that they're going to make those blood vessels dilate? Um, they're actually going to make those muscles constrict. And the reason why is we don't want the skin getting the blood. We want to divert the blood to the heart, to the lungs, to the brain. Okay? We're diverting the blood. And the skin stores a lot of blood. So if we can get these blood vessels to constrict, we can push that blood towards our heart, towards our brain. That's what we need when we're in fight or flight mode. Right? Okay, so that's the sympathetic nervous system. Now the last thing we need to know about the sympathetic nervous system are the, um, we need to know the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. So we've been hearing about ACH. Correct? Okay, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. So acetylcholine is going to be the neurotransmitter released here between the preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron. Okay? But then when we look at the effector, and we go up here to the um, smooth muscle of the bronchioles or the cardiac muscle tissue, that's going to be a different neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter is norepinephrine it's norepinephrine okay that neurotransmitter is norepinephrine and another name for norepinephrine is adrenaline so that makes sense now doesn't it so if you're having adrenaline released at your heart it's going to beat faster if you have adrenaline released at your lungs those bronchioles, those airways are going to open up, right? If you have them released at the salivary glands, it's going to inhibit them and you're going to dry up. If you have them released at your, um, um, let's see over here, um, at the digestive tract, that's going to um, inhibit them and slow them down, right? So that's what gets released. Norepinephrine gets released at the effectors. Now, with the sympathetic nervous system, there are a couple of exceptions, of course, to what I've been talking about. So I'm gonna, there's two exceptions that I want you to know about. First of all, when we look at the preganglionic neurons, I told you all the preganglionic neurons are short and all the postganglionic neurons are long. Well, there is one place that there's only a preganglionic neuron. And that is this adrenal gland right here. So this is your kidney. You have two kidneys. And right above that kidney, each kidney has an adrenal gland sitting on top of it. And the very middle of that adrenal gland um, is the adrenal medulla. So the inside of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal medulla. And if we look at the adrenal medulla, we can see the neuron there. And we follow that neuron all the way back, and we see that it, there's only one neuron. So there's only a preganglionic neuron, and it's very long. Very long. And now it's going to stimulate that adrenal medulla to release two hormones. Okay? So we're going to talk about this when we get to um, the, the endocrine system, but we're also going to need to know about it now. So it's going to release norepinephrine, and it's also going to release epinephrine. So the adrenal medulla releases norepinephrine and epinephrine, and then those two hormones are going to go into the bloodstream. And then the bloodstream is going to carry norepinephrine and epinephrine to all of those organs. So now we got a double effect. Right? Now we have norepinephrine being released by all of these postganglionic neurons, but now we also have the adrenal medulla putting out norepinephrine and epinephrine through the blood and reaching all of those organs. Right? So we get like a double whammy. 
okay, when we activate that sympathetic nervous system. That makes sure that all of those organs become um, sympathetically activated, right? So that's the first exception, the adrenal medulla, okay? The second, ex um, the second exception are the salivary glands over here. Uh, sorry, are the um, sweat glands over here, sweat glands. We have the preganglionic neuron here, and ACH is released there. We have the postganglionic neuron, and then um, ACH is released there. So we have ACH released at both places. Instead of norepinephrine uh, being released here, we have ACH being released here. So um, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, it will just cause that postganglionic neuron to release ACH, and you'll get sweating when you have sympathetic activation. Right. So let's talk about why um, why that would be important. Why would we need to know that? Right. So um, when we are talking about acetylcholine being released at a synapse, and it doesn't matter where it is, we call ACH. We call that synapse cholinergic. It's a cholinergic synapse. So that's whenever ACH is released. Some medications that people get are called cholinergic drugs. Cholinergic drugs. So a cholinergic drug would act like ACH gets into the bloodstream, and it travels through the bloodstream to all those organs. If ACH were to contact the receptors on all of these different viscera, would you get a sympathetic reaction? What was the neurotransmitter that I said was released at all of these viscera? Adrenaline, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is going to is going to activate these viscera. If I released ACH, would ACH affect these? No, ACH isn't going to affect these. But would that drug affect that sweat gland? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So one of the things we have to watch for when giving cholinergic drugs is the effect that it has on the sweat glands, and a patient might end up with sweating. Right? They might have they may have sweat. So that's um, so these are these are um, in advanced. When we get to advanced, we're going to talk about the different types of receptors that are found on each of those viscera. But for right now, all I need you to know is that at this junction between the pre and the post, that's ACH that's being released, acetylcholine, and then at the effector, that's norepinephrine that's being released. Okay, and then our exception. The adrenal medulla and the sweat gland. Okay, so now we're going to look at the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, all right, same thing with the parasympathetic nervous system. We're going to look at preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons. First thing we look at is where do they exit the central nervous system? Are they exiting between T1 and L2? No. Where are they exiting? They're exiting from four cranial nerves and three sacral nerves. Okay, those are the neurons that are going to those are the those are the spinal nerves and the cranial nerves that are going to carry parasympathetic information. Four cranial nerves and three sacral nerves. Nothing else in that spinal cord, right? And if we look at the four cranial nerves, I don't want you to memorize which four cranial nerves they are, but I do want you to know this one, the vagus nerve. Cranial nerve 10 carries 75% of all the parasympathetic activity. All the 75% of all parasympathetic information travels through that vagus nerve, that cranial 10 nerve. Okay. 
Okay, so um, let's look at the organs. Uh, let's look at the preganglionic and the postganglionic neuron. Here's the preganglionic neuron. The preganglionic neuron is very long. Okay. The black here, that's the postganglionic neuron, that's very short. So it's exactly the opposite of what we saw in the sympathetic nervous system. So parasympathetic has long preganglionic, short postganglionic neurons. Okay. Um, the next thing are, is the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. All those organs there were the same ones that we saw in the sympathetic nervous system, so we can say those those glands and muscles are duly innervated. They're duly innervated. Okay? You see a couple differences. One difference, at least, if we look up there at the um, lacrimal gland, we didn't see that before. The lacrimal gland produces tears. Right? So let's think about the rest and digest activity of the parasympathetic nervous system. When you think of the parasympathetic nervous system, you need to think of everything starts secreting. Everything starts secreting, all right? You get juices flowing when you're resting and digesting. So the lacrimal gland, would you be producing tears or inhibiting tears? Producing tears, right? You just ate a big meal and you're ready to settle down and take a nap. Do you think that your eye muscles, your pupils, are going to constrict or dilate? They're going to constrict. So the pupil constrictor muscles get activated and the pupils constrict. Everything is shutting down, slowing down. Salivary glands, what are they going to do? They're going to secrete, start producing saliva. What about the heart? Heart's going to slow down, right? We don't need energy. We don't need the heart beating real fast. What about the lungs? Slow way down. You're getting ready to rest and digest. What about all the digestive glands? They're going to start secreting, secreting, secreting. You're in rest and digest mode. So mucus gets secreted. Digestive enzymes get secreted. Bile gets secreted. Everything's getting secreted to digest your food, right? What about, would this be the proper time to um, produce urine? Yeah, yeah. You're going to start producing urine. So the kidneys are going to start functioning to produce urine. Um, in the, um, rest, in the um, reproductive system, that's um, needed. The parasympathetic activation is needed for arousal in both the male and the female. Then if we look over here to the left, we don't see the, the erector pili muscle. We don't see the sweat glands. We don't see the peripheral blood vessels. They are not activated by the parasympathetic nervous system. So they, they are only sympathetic nervous system. Look at the adrenal gland. Nothing going to the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is only activated by the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. And then the last thing that we need to discuss with the parasympathetic nervous system are the neurotransmitters, right? So the neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter between the preganglionic and postganglionic neuron, again, just like the sympathetic nervous system, is ACH. ACH is the neurotransmitter released there. Again, it's going to bind to the postganglionic neuron. Um, ACH gets released, binds to the postganglionic neuron, opens up those sodium gates. Sodium comes in, we get a new action potential. Everything we've already been learning. Now, the postganglionic neuron. It's going to come in contact with the smooth muscle, the cardiac muscle, the glands, and it's going to release at the effector ACH. So in the parasympathetic nervous system, both synapses are cholinergic. Both synapses release ACH. Between the pre and the postganglionic neuron, and between the postganglionic neuron and the effectors. Okay. There's another chart, uh, there's another figure in here that you can look at. Um, this is a nice short chart, kind of tells you some of those differences that we looked at. The only thing it doesn't really have here is the location. So we know that um, the sympathetic nervous system, 
That gets released between T1 and L2. So sometimes we call that the thoracolumbar nervous system. Okay. Um, parasympathetic gets released between the cranial nerves and the sacral nerves. So sometimes we call that craniosacral. Okay. So anyway, the, that's kind of shown on the other chart. But what we can see on here, um, here's the parasympathetic nervous system, which we just went over. We have a long preganglionic neuron. And then it synapses onto a short postganglionic neuron. And then that synapses onto those effectors, the target cells, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. The black arrow here, that indicates that the um, neurotransmitter used there is acetylcholine. The black arrows there indicate that the neurotransmitter used there is acetylcholine. Okay. Here's the sympathetic nervous system. Short preganglionic neuron, long postganglionic neuron, okay? and then here's the effectors. Here, between the pre and the postganglionic neurons, we have this black arrow indicating ACH. Here at the effector, we have these green arrows indicating norepinephrine. And then we have um, over here, we have the um, adrenal medulla. Describing the adrenal medulla. We have the preganglionic neuron synapsing onto the adrenal medulla, which is showing up here, and then that is releasing norepinephrine and epinephrine into the bloodstream. And the norepinephrine and epinephrine travel through the bloodstream and then get released to the target organ. So that target organ then will be getting both norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay. And that is all I have for, the, for um, chapter 16, okay? So I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have um, the, one, the one class can, can leave and have a great break.